Welcome everyone. Guten Morgen aus Berlin. Labas Rites, Lietuva. Thank you all for finding the time to attend today's webinar organized by Enterprise Lithuania, Lithuanian Embassy in Germany and German Baltic Chamber of Commerce in Lithuania. And uh, my special thank go, you goes to our German partners uh, for their presentations and, and participation today. Before the start, it is to mention that the um, German market is the biggest one and uh, it is quite close to Lithuania geographically. It is the market number one for Lithuanian exports, especially for goods of Lithuanian origin. The goal of this webinar is to discuss online trade opportunities in Germany in order to enter this market for Lithuanian enterprises in this digital way. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. Yes. So, my name is Sharuna Shablavicina and I am commercial attaché of Lithuania in Germany, based at the Embassy in, of Lithuania in Berlin. I will start this webinar with a brief overview of e-commerce trends in Germany. Then, uh, Mr. Flo Florian Lange, expert for retail and logistics from Bitcom Association, will talk about German habits in retail markets and how it, it was affected by the COVID-19. The next topic will be presented by Mr. Josef Schmaus, Managing Director of the company Outline Online Median GmbH. He will discuss digital brand management and how it could help Lithuanian enterprises to enter the German market. Then, Dr. Dangwale Hakel, Council at Evershed's Sutherland Law Company will present us opportunities how to sell directly from abroad to the German market and what are regulatory requirements for that online business. After each presentation, there will be a short Q&A session. You can send us questions during the webinar in the comment section and we will answer them after. So, let's begin. As I mentioned, before our guest speakers, I would like to provide you a quick overview of trends and tendencies of local and cross-border e-commerce in Germany. German online market is the fifth uh, biggest market in the world and the second biggest in Europe by the revenue. Revenue of the e-commerce is projected uh, to reach uh, more than 72 billion in 2020. And it is expected to show continued annual growth of 6.5% uh, uh, despite COVID-19. As you can see, the German market has more than 62 million users, uh, users this year and it is predicted to reach 68 million by 2024. This provides us a lot of possibilities and opportunities for the brands and companies to reach millions of consumers in Germany, as well as in other German speaking countries like Switzerland and Austria. Here in this slide, you can see the forecasted development of the revenue in a few major sectors uh, for the upcoming years. All the sectors are expected to grow, including consumer electronics and fashion sectors, which generate around a half of the whole online retail sales. It is anticipated that food and personal care will be the growing fastest and uh, in 2020 uh, it should increase by 25% while in the following years by 10-11% yearly. Now let's take a look at the German online market users in uh, 2019 
uh, and how they differ based on age, gender, and income views. As you can see in the diagram on the left side, the main group of the users were between uh, 45 and uh, 54 years old, almost 26%. However, there was no substantial difference from the other four age groups. If we look at the gender dis distribution, uh, we can see that women and men were using the online retail almost equally. And um, we can see similar trends between the users with low, medium, or a high income. These uh, few graphs illustrate us uh, that German online market has broad range of users from various uh, social and economic backgrounds. The next topic I would like to touch upon is the cross-border e-commerce in Germany. And there are good and bad news to tell. The bad news is that from over 62 million German online shoppers, only 12% of them are active now in cross-border e-commerce. On the other hand, the good news is that the biggest part of German cross-border e-commerce shopping comes from the European Union. It makes 69%. It is worth to, know, to note that uh, a large portion of uh, German retailers are actually not presented online yet, 67%. Uh, uh, and this can positively influence the cross-border shopping. If we look at the main tendencies of shopping cross-border, uh, we see that 68% uh, of uh, German consumers said um, they prefer larger well-known global stores for cross-border shopping and more than half of them, 55%, prefer shopping on websites that are in their native German language. Nevertheless, 35% of respondents do not prioritize the location of the online retailers and 20% um, of German consumers admit that uh, they trust both out of country and German stores equally. So uh, what you should pay attention if you want to enter German online market. Uh, the, there are four main issues uh, to tell, to consider and um, I will only mention them briefly here. I'm sure that my colleagues today will elaborate them uh, more. First of all, uh, it is to mention that German consumers are very demanding and uh, they value their safety online and uh, are especially cautious to provide their personal data online that includes um, uh, bank card payment information uh, or other information. Secondly, they consider the price of the item they like to compare, they like to think about and um, compare it uh, with other retailers and uh, prefer to do online shopping uh, for more uh, small and not so expensive things like clothing, uh, books, electronics, sporting goods, etc. Third, German like, uh, Germans like to be well informed about the items they are uh, about to purchase, uh, they read recommendations, uh, and it's not surprising that they prefer the websites in German language. And uh, last but not least, uh, the German consumers want flexibility of their re retailers. They like to be able to choose the delivery method, delivery duration, pick up locations, and the flexible return options. And knowing all these aspects and, of course, more details is important and um, could probably help uh, for stores out there in Germany to reach German consumers and gain their trust. So um, this was my uh, short uh, general overview of uh, German e-commerce market. And um, 
If you have any questions uh, for me uh, later, you can uh, contact me by email or phone or LinkedIn. And um, now uh, let's go to our first guest presentation. Uh, today, uh, I stop sharing my, my presentation. And uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Florian Lange. Uh, he is uh, responsible for retail and logistics in the biggest uh, German digital association, Bitcom. Uh, his tasks are to connect different key industry players, speak on the behalf of the association uh, for political questions, and uh, organize the annual digital retail conference in Berlin. Bitcom uh, represents more than 2,700 uh, uh, companies of the digital economy in Germany and virtually unites all global players. So, uh, dear Florian, uh, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. So, now you should see my presentation. Good. So um, welcome everyone um, to the presentation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the German retail market, especially the German e-commerce market um, and its peculiarities and opportunities. Um, I think this could be a good introduction for you if you want to launch your business in Germany or um, if you in think of investing in the German e-commerce market. So what will we discuss today? Um, the first part of the presentation is a little bit about the status quo of um, the German e-commerce markets. I'm going to give you a short glance of the landscape of online shops. Um, I'm going to speak about Corona's impact and the typical top sellers, as we've seen some of them um, before in Sharuna's uh, presentation. Um, the second part of the presentation will um, be a little bit more about the criteria for success in the German e-commerce market. This might be very practical for you. Um, we're going to speak about the channels um, you might use, the payment methods, um, the possibility of online evaluations, and about the big topic in Germany, sustainability. So let's start with the first, um, just some general um, part. Um, online shopping is as popular as the walk in the stationary shop. Um, in total, 94% of all internet users um, buy stuff in the internet, um, which is equivalent to 55 million Germans. Um, if you think of a population of 80 or 82 million Germans, um, this is a huge share. And um, every third German um, shops online every week. So um, there is a high potential. We see that Germany is already very digital and open-minded open -minded regarding um, e-commerce. Um, these are the top 100 online shops. Um, thanks to um, the EHI Retail Institute, which has um, a very good um, research on this. Um, we can see that, uh, yeah, Amazon is, of course, the typical leader here. But we also see um, uh, some typical German companies like Otto or Zalando. Um, and we see that some of these companies haven't even existed um, one or 10, 10 years ago. So um, the German retail market and e-commerce market is open for startups and also for um, external companies and external companies that might quickly grow. Um, and we see in general that, um, of course, the generalists like Amazon are relatively successful or very successful, but we also see some areas like um, touristics or groceries and, um, of course, fashion and high-fi um, high products um, that are um, yeah, sold in the German e-commerce market. This means um, we have um, a very good yeah, let's say landscape for different ways of um, investing in the German e-commerce market. Um, so, but this were, were numbers of before COVID-19. Um, how does this has impact on um, the German retail market in general and also, of course, uh, the e-commerce market? Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit the tale of the crisis. Um, people usually think that there must have been a huge booster for online shopping and for online markets in March or April. Um, because, I mean, the shops were closed, um, people were at home, um, but this wasn't really true. Um, we can see that we had a much higher saving rate in Germany and much more uncertainty in the economy in general, which means that people um, didn't really want to invest in at all, but not in the stationary retail, but also not in the German e-commerce market. This leads to the minus 20% 
um, uh, sales and e-commerce in margin um, in comparison to the year 2019. Um, however, we can say luckily that these numbers have changed in the opposite direction now. Um, we see that people say that they um, buy more products online, 20% of the people say this, um, but also, which is quite interesting, that people see the solution for the crisis also in e-commerce um, when they say that e-commerce has a central front um, nutrition function. Um, and the last thing which I want to make you aware of, which might be um, surprising to you, is that Germans like online shops, which um, are also regional. So they say, if they have an online shop, I try to support the German retailer. 66% of the Germans could say this. So there is a connectivity between um, local um, customers and local markets. Um, but this shouldn't uh, scare you, um, as we see in the next slides. Um, just some top sellers. What do we buy online? I'm going to go quickly through this slide because Sharon already um, told you a little bit about this. Um, uh, in general, we can say there is nothing which doesn't exist in the German e-commerce market. And um, the top sellers are not surprisingly fashion, shoes, accessoires, um, but also, which is quite interesting, some products that are usually um, things for the stationary market. Um, so, for example, furniture. Usually people went to um, these big houses and buy furniture there, but this has changed a little bit and people already go um, in online shops to buy furniture. Um, so um, there are multiple business opportunities and um, uh, Germans do not really have a clear target of um, products which they buy on. And you can be successful, on the other hand, with a wide range of um, products. And um, my feeling is, in general, that we have some rising stars. This is the snapshot of the most successful products now, but the rising stars are, um, as we can see, See here, groceries, services, and pharmaceuticals. Um, let's start with the groceries. Online groceries were always said to be the top rising star in the last years. In 2000, for example, there was an analysis which predicted that we will have 20% um, uh, share in the whole grocery market with online, shop, um, online groceries. This was de facto not true. This never happened. Um, yet I included um, this area in my predictions, um, as we can see very clear hints in the Corona crisis. Germans began to shop groceries online um, and Germans are already uh, ready to buy groceries online, which is not shown. Um, the second part is that um, German supermarkets are generally very um, offline and only rarely own, uh, online and develop their own business model. Um, so there are already some um, external companies that are um, relatively um, successful in the German mark, um, um, supermarket market, grocery market. Um, the second part is services. Um, usually you'd say that the plumber next door or the homework support for your son um, is a very regional thing. Yes, but we can see that there is the tendency to um, yeah, fulfill these things um, externally. And, um, I think with the digitization, um, these services can be fulfilled everywhere, also from Lithuania. And um, this shows that the internet brings people together and makes businesses more or less irrelevant. So there's a high potential um, for even external companies. And the last thing, I think this might be clear, pharmaceuticals, because of the corona crisis, um, this has got a huge boost in the last um, a couple of months. Um, yet, we can also see that um, the German regulations are much lower now. Um, as the online recipe is allowed. So um, huge uh, medical companies um, are very successful in the German e-commerce market in the recent um, months. Um, and to um, finish this part of the presentation with some current trends, um, we see that the um, general growth of the stationary retail in 2019 was about 1.2%. So it grew a little bit. But in comparison, the e-commerce market in um, uh, comparison was 9.1%. Um, even if this is a, on a lower share, on a lower level, we can see that it is, we could say, um, a quickly rising, quickly developing dwarf um, the e-commerce market. So there is a huge potential. This was the first part of the um, presentation on the general status quo. Let's dive a little bit more into the criteria of success in the German e-commerce market which might also be interesting for you when you think of launching a business in the German market. Um, 
The first thing I want to show you is that um, uh, end commerce is getting much more important. Every second online shopper is active with his or her smartphone. Um, this is more than twice, more than twice the number of what we could identify in 2014, so five years or six years ago. Um, it has already leveled with shopping via laptop. And um, this might be a good lesson for external companies also. Um, I would always suggest try to have a website or even an app that is mobile compatible. Um, especially as we can see here, young um, shoppers are online. Um, but this really doesn't um, mean that they are only the ones who are online. If we think of 36% um, um, of the online shoppers who are between 50 and 64 years old. So um, this group is rising, this group is highly digitized, and this group uses their smartphones. Um, so I think this is very important that you, that you um, focus on smartphones in the German e-commerce market, and maybe also in other markets. Um, the second thing I want to show you is that online payment services are highly prevalent, um, especially when people are asked where they buy online. Um, they say that online payment services are important for them. So um, when they have a free choice, they want to use online services. I personally have to say, I expect um, a steep further rise in the, those methods like PayPal, for example. Um, and um, I see a decline in purchase, purchase on, uh, on invoice or direct debit. Um, so what is in for you? I would say, um, don't be shy and use the services that exist and don't hesitate to pay the cost that might bring with them. And um, that these, um, uh, technologies might have. Um, it is, of course, difficult to say in, in times in which the biggest German payment facilitator is the reason for a big, huge financial scandal, but I would say it pays off to um, uh, invest in modern technology, um, especially in the payment uh, sector. Um, the third one uh, I would give you as a hint is um, that customer evaluations are relevant. That sounds a little bit weird and it sounds a little bit low level, but it is highly important um, because my advice is in general, always be transparent. Germans love transparency and concrete communication, even more than in other uh, European uh, market. Um, and we can see that 56% um, say that they are using other customer evaluations in an online shop before the decision to buy a product. So a huge um, uh, share. Um, this becomes even more important when we think of these criminal fake shops um, that have success in the recent years. And apart from that, more than every second says that evaluations of others are important um, when choosing the product, online. not only the um, online shop, but also product. Um, especially women say this, and interestingly, 62% um, um, uh, say that this is their opinion. Um, so a good thing for you is it is not difficult to set up a commentary function, for example, and it also will get you some direct feedback. So I would always um, advise you to have some kind of communication um, with the customer and some transparency in um, the online shopping. Um, the fourth part I want to put um, uh, an emphasis on, and this is the, maybe the biggest thing, is um, sustainability. It is the most relevant topic of these days, and especially and also in Germany. Um, please don't see this as a problem for your e-commerce company, but more than a chance. I will give you some um, information on this later on. Um, many retailers, especially in the e-commerce market, are said to be not sustainable in Germany. Um, so you can use your role as a new player to establish, let's say, a green label or, um, for your company. Um, it has the huge chance to make you relevant and gives you many um, advantages to be the new player. Um, regarding the numbers, they show you um, that the way of packaging is very important. And this, again, sounds a little bit low level and a little bit weird. Um, but I know that um, Germans do have a high sustainable thinking in these practical, very easy things. And um, even these relatively small problems like packaging waste will result in annoyed customers. So my advice for you is don't try to be some way sustainable. You can be very offensive and you can be um, uh, and, and your customers will be thankful for it. Um, the next part uh, slide will also focus on the environment. Maybe this gives you an overview on the most important and relevant aspects 
um, after the presentation because there are some some numbers which might um, be interesting for you. Um, I would like to put some emphasis on the last number, 37%. So 37% um, say that um, they would pay an additional fee for a CO2 compensation. Um, and this shows, in my opinion, the importance of the point that people are ready to buy or pay more. Um, the point here is it makes sense to be somewhere creative in um, uh, this topic. And um, I think you can see these technological opportunities um, and you can try to identify them when you think of sustainability. Um, and always think of this very important number, 54%. 54% of the German online shoppers um, say that e-commerce is not more pollutive for the environment in general than a stationary retail. They say that some companies are more polluted, but not the e-commerce in general. And only 37% can say that this is more so unpolluted. So um, I think these numbers should show you that Germans are not skeptical per se. Um, the, and, and you don't have to feel much backlash if you present yourself as an, a sustainable e-commerce company. So my last slide here is um, something that should sum up um, some basic thoughts and some basic life guidelines that might help you in the German e-commerce market. We've already talked um, about sustainability. I just put it in, in the slide again. Um, and I think we don't have to go in this detail again. But um, what I want to fo fo focus on is transparency. Um, and I think this is one of the most important and relevant things for you. Um, Germans, as I said, love clear communication channels. And these also might include low-level things like a chatbot or the possibility of um, email responses um, if you have a new um, uh, question or if you have these just usual, usual um, um, offers. Um, so I would say it is very important for you because you are a company from outside of Germany. Um, and this will lead to some way of skepticism. Always have in mind, Germans like to buy regional they have a very high um, um, um yeah affection for regional for regional um uh, e-commerce so you have the chance that you are a, um, a company from outside of germany you have to be transparent and people will might might ask a question like um is this address um uh, uh, or this online shop trustworthy um will they deliver quickly enough um and these are questions you might proactively um, um address when people go on your website and um, see that it, this origins maybe are from outside of Germany. So be always transparent and have a good communication. Um, omnichannel um, is the other um, buzzword I would um, put on here. Um, this means that you should have different channels um, to communicate. But this also means that you should use technologies that exist in the market. Um, for example, design a good app or um, a website that is compatible with um, your smartphone. So be as close as possible to the customers, in my opinion. Um, and the last one is and maybe, maybe the most important point here, which should at least bring you, bring you some brief um, uh, understanding of the German market. Be patient with the introduction of your technology. Um, the German customers are, yes, online and digital, but also some kind of um, conservative. They, are, um, they, they use these new digital tools, but they need their time to adapt to them. So my advice is, be patient with the Germans, but also be patient with the German authorities as well. We have a bureaucratic apparatus which will make some things very cumbersome and very difficult, and be aware of this. Um, this might um, yeah, lead to a little bit more time when you, when you plan your business. Um, the German bureaucracy will always have some concerns or problems. Um, but I think um, now you have some very good advisors here in the uh, Lithuanian um, embassy. Um, um, that also have organized this great meeting. So I think um, you can always ask them if you have a question on, on the German politics there. Um, so this was my presentation. I hope that you've enjoyed it and you learned some um, relevant or good um, uh, things about the German e-commerce market and just um, contact me if you want and you can also ask some uh, questions uh, later on or just call me. Great. Uh... Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Florian. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation, and I'm sure that uh, very, very good points were mentioned. And uh, we have some uh, questions from the audience, if you don't mind. And uh, uh, one was uh, from Advance, and it is about uh, what 
are the typical do's and don'ts uh, for the establishing a business in the German retail market? Could you comment that? Yes, um, I would. I would say um, at first, don't be too quick with the launch of products. Focus maybe on at first on one product you um, know and you uh, are very experienced with, um, and that you want to sell. It is important that you grow naturally and, and you really don't want too much. Maybe some products that um, are successful in another com um, country might not be successful in Germany. So always try to identify your product, which is your core product in Germany. Um, this is, I think, the most basic common mistake also German companies do, that they want too much in the e-commerce market because they think there are so many opportunities there online. Um, the second point is, um, uh, I would I would not expect always these highly digital people in the e-commerce market. Yes, the young people are very digitized. Older people also use digital technologies, as I said, um, but um, they are not all digital natives. So these use these very low level um, uh, technologies like email responses, chatbots, for example, um, that people are already used to. and. Um, so, so you always have to be very, very clear with your, your um, channels you, you use and um, you always have to be as close to the customer as possible, I would say. So um, you must have a very good sales apparatus, especially for foreign companies, I think. Um, always think of the numbers that say that customers like to support their regional business in general. Thank you. And uh, we still have some uh, some time and uh, uh, some uh, uh, questions uh, are written. Uh, I would like to one one enterprise would like to ask. Uh, they say uh, that uh, we open company in Germany, and which uh, social media you offering for advertising in Germany? I think this question is uh, probably for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... I think it depends, of course, always, it always depends. It depends on um, the company you are. Um, if you have the target group of young people and, and young digital people, I would definitely say Instagram is very important. Um, just one example, there was a restaurant here um, which had to close during the Corona crisis and um, they sold um, their products and, and their goods online via Instagram in the Instagram stories with a very small um, uh, menu. So, um, and they were highly successful with that because they had um, these, yeah, typically young young students, for example, um, who were were um, usually used to go um, in this restaurant. So I would say if you have a younger um, um, uh, target group, then use use Instagram. But also um, the thing is, um, Facebook is also possible for for the um, let's say let's let's say a little bit older generation. Um, in general, the good thing for social media is you um, have the chance of a uh, low level, low key um, um, communication. It doesn't cost you a lot to um, set up a social media account. So just, just start with all the different accounts and look what is um, the most successful one. You can have a Twitter account, you can have an Instagram account, you can have a Snapchat account, a Facebook account, and you will always um, have some, some kind of um, communication with your customers. It doesn't cost a lot. It doesn't cost you so much time. It makes sense to, to um, uh, invest in these, these things. Yeah. Um, thank you. And what about Xing or LinkedIn? Uh, what is uh, more popular? What do, what do you see? Mm, difficult to say. I think, um, especially when you are an international company, I would advise you to have, use LinkedIn a little bit more. Um, because this makes you gives you the opportunities also to sell maybe a little bit more broadly than not only in Germany. Um, of course, Xing is also um, a, a good good way of of communicating of communicating. Um, but I would always go with LinkedIn to be honest. And I see um, that there is a shift a little bit more from Xing to LinkedIn because this is just a little bit more international. So I would I would go on the long run with LinkedIn. Um, in the moment, yes, why, why not sing if you have the time for this? Um, but um, in general, I would, I would always prefer LinkedIn. Thank you. Uh, one another question, if uh, you don't mind, uh, just uh, to, to, to know your opinion, is uh, one um, high tech company asks uh, what um, about online payment uh, services? Uh, which provider is most popular for German e shops? Um, PayPal. 
PayPal um, is, is definitely also the rising star. If we, if we talk about the rising stars in groceries and so on, um, we can also talk about um, PayPal, which is already very established and is um, getting much more established in, in recent um, years. Um, there are also some other providers like Klarna. Um, um, I think it's a Swedish company um, which, which um, um, helps you. And I would, I would say that those are the most typical um, um, payment providers in Germany. Thank you, Florian. Uh, it was really interesting, and uh, I think we, we will discuss uh, later on uh, at the end uh, a little bit. And uh, now it's time to move to our second uh, guest, uh, Mr. Josef Schmaus. Uh, is a consultant for brand and digital market development with uh, more than 25 years of experience in customer projects. Um, he is founder and managing director, director of Outline Online Media, uh, GmbH, and uh, this company is uh, a digitization agency in Munich, uh, Bavaria. Um, consulting and implementation of uh, digital strategies and uh, as well as planning and uh, on implementation of online shops are the core areas of the agency, uh, which mainly works for medium-sized uh, companies uh, in uh, various uh, industries. So now um, Mr. Schmaus uh, will present us uh, the topic, uh, digital brand management as the key uh, to entering the German market. And uh, please, uh, Mr. Schmaus. Yes, hello everybody. A warmly welcome from my side. Um, I, after a lot of figures and uh, facts about the German um, market, um, in e-commerce, I will follow up uh, with some um, more emotional uh, sides on the topic. Um, that means uh, how to present yourself um, in a, a highly competitive market. And uh, I start now my presentation. So when you have a look on Germany, may pardon? Do you see it? No. Okay, sorry about this. So, okay, let's start. Um, yeah. When you have a, a look uh, from uh, uh, onto the German market and the German business and economy, maybe you have in mind a few of um, these these brands and maybe you compare your own company with these brands but this is not the benchmark i want to present you i want uh, to foster your own side on your own company and maybe um, having a new view on your business that means you should have a, a site on, on your company as a brand. And this might be unfamiliar at the moment, but it is a very um, impressive for the German market. So it is uh, the most threats they are done when you start a business from outside is maybe uh, you, ha you, have, you are very enthusiastic and uh, high energized and you want to enter it. And uh, this leads in a um, lot of cases to an information overload that means all information about your company, about your products, about everything around this, you um, 
present on a website and uh, this is highly informative uh, maybe but it is uh, very full and it is not um, a complete picture of uh, your services and your uh, products you have so it is your next site on the market to uh, get smarter and uh, this the way is to make a process which you clear who you are who you are and what do you want to reach and uh, as florian said before it is uh, probably uh, better to focus on um, a small size of uh, and range of products a small range of um, uh, targets um, that you focus on. When you found this, and I will talk a little bit later more in detail, uh, then you have to look um, at the next opportunity to, to the, your competitors. How do they do the business? Where are they present? Which um, social media channels do they use and how do they use it? So it is worth to analyze everything you have in your biotop of uh, competitors. The next, the third step is, and question before you start your product, uh, project is um, that you focus on your target groups. Who do you want to win? Who will buy your products and who are not your target groups. And the last step before starting is uh, which work has to be done and who should do this work. So it's important to make it in this role and not top down, top down and not bottom up. So brand is probably um, a familiar term for you, but probably not. Brand just means that is in a, a view on your own company, on your own organization as a whole, not only um, with focus on your products, for instance, but uh, a lot of different factors. We have developed um, so-called brand wheel uh, with um, at least eight factors we prove through a circle and develop in uh, close to our customers um, a brand picture which is at the first uh, a picture for yourself because it is not easy to uh, look at yourself without being uh, subjective uh, it is important to make a structure and to analyze your uh, brand as it is because a company already is a brand always probably it is not uh, aware of this and it has to be developed but it is still a brand because you can't not communicate. And communication makes the difference between different companies, producers, and uh, players in the market. There are brands who can mirror a lot of wishes and needs of their customers and others, they are not able to talk about this and uh, to give the customers the suggestion that they can benefit from services or uh, products of this brand and this company. So we use two ways, the persona model and big data analysis to um, getting aware of, of uh, the standing of um, your communication and uh, plans to foster it and to 
um, bring your picture into the public. So what, uh, for instance, is a little uh, example. Um, when you see such a picture, you can differ between uh, different products. Um, this is uh, a math. This is uh, shoes, uh, our shoes, some uh, accessories, um, sports accessories. But when you open your, your eyes, it is a scene. So it is, um, of course, not, not very natural. It is uh, for the photographer, you see, it is uh, not very authentic, but it shows you, for instance, a, a yoga uh, session uh, preparation for a yoga session. But maybe it is um, even not this. It is uh, more uh, illustration for a story uh, about this uh, young woman, or it is a story about uh, 10 ways making uh, yoga more um, successful or every other things you can imagine. And that means even when you want to sell yoga mat, it is not important or the center of the whole story, um, you have to make an emotional biotope for it. You have to tell stories around of your products, around of the benefits customers have when they use your products. So it is a, a need of storytelling, of strategies, uh, how to implement uh, stories about um, your products in the informed market. Now I want to give you some of the um, parts of a project which are important um, when you foster your digital strategy going into the market. First, it is the, the big environment, um, which are the conditions. The conditions are maybe not so different to your country because we are all in the European U Union and we have uh, common legal information we have to present. We have common uh, standards for data protection uh, but probably there are a lot of um, different things and uh, specialities. I don't want to, to go in deep here uh, because uh, after me, uh, Danguele Hackel will um, give you the details for this. But this is what you first have to consider. As I mentioned, have an eye on your competitors. Who is in the market? Um, how do they present themselves? That has an influence uh, about your strategy. Is your website, uh, for instance, more an image building, a uh, brand orientated um, um, communication um, channel, or is it uh, mainly for distributing your goods? Um, do you focus on a marketplace like Amazon or eBay or um, any other big um, marketplaces? Or do you have an additionally an own shop or um, you focus on your own shop? This depends also on your competitor. Your own media it is a little bit like the ground you can build your uh, house on. That means uh, you are free. Um, what you do there, you can change it and uh, develop it uh, for the future needs. That means, um, as we heard from Florian, mobile um, access on um, web pages are increasing very strongly. So we see 
some uh, websites, they have more than 80% in the meantime, um, the visitors use smartphone devices. And that means the strategy for building a website is um, absolutely mobile first, as well technically regarded as uh, um, uh, from the content and the uh, visualization and um, where you uh, give your customers your uh, ways through your offer. But um, you have you, you have to also you have to look on the on the blog, on the newsletter, and even on the printed material. Um, we saw in the COVID-19 crisis uh, that printed material is, uh, is again has a little renaissance. Of course, not like uh, years before, but more um, in addition to digital um, offers. Search engine visibility is a, a very important topic. Um, the, the power of Google is uh, so high and uh, uh, it is a tool which most of the users in all uh, countries and in, with all devices use very often uh, a day. So Google is our key to the world. We, not, we don't use it only for having simple phrases or buzzwords or uh, keywords. Uh, we copy complete phrases into Google and we hope that we get a um, competent answer. And uh, this is uh, the other side of the coin when we make content marketing. So when we offer an interesting story to a question somebody types in to Google, probably we are the winner and uh, the customer will buy some uh, connected goods uh, with this article. It is also important to make your customers being involved. Being involved uh, uh, can mean a lot of things. So uh, liking something or giving a comment is one thing or um, getting involved with your uh, customer line, for instance. Um, so we have a lot of uh, social media channels where people interact uh, not only with your company uh, but peer-to-peer um, um, -peer and uh, between the customers and they give their suggestions and their experience very freely uh, to each other and to foster this and to make this uh, possible is also uh, an important topic. And that means social media influence, um, it is influ uh, there is a high influence of social media, of the right channels. And uh, for instance, we have uh, at the moment an actual uh, project with a uh, grocer of uh, tulip uh, onions. And uh, tulip onions, for instance, are very highly recommended uh, with Pinterest. Pinterest is also a social media platform, but um, it's a little bit different to Instagram and uh, to Facebook. Uh, so um, my suggestion is um, to focus on one channel because don't, uh, don't mind, uh, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work uh, to make, uh, uh, to go into touch with your customers uh, means that you are very fast in uh, touch with them. Um, so you should have to, uh, you should focus on one channel, uh, of course, having presences to others as well, 
but uh, look on your resources. And it is not so um, an amateur uh, view on this when you have to be uh, in touch day by day and uh, be aware of what is discussed in the uh, social media uh, sphere. Yeah, so that's um, the end of my presentation. I hope uh, I gave you some um, suggestions how to enter your project and how to foster it, how to prepare it. And uh, I hope you take your chance and uh, see you in Germany in digital or real life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Josef. Uh, it was uh, uh, very, very informative and uh, steps uh, uh, pointed out. And um, there are some uh, questions from audience. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind, uh, we uh, the one is about uh, uh, enterprise. One enterprise asks, yeah. Uh, we already have an online presence in English and Lithuanian, and is it enough to translate it into German? I think um, it is possible, of course. It is a, a way of international uh, internationalization, but only for basic information. Uh, when you really want to go in, involved with the, uh, your customers, uh, you should. Um, change uh, the, the view and the customer journey through your website. And the, uh, that means um, you should um, try to make a different uh, structure of how people uh, go through your site and uh, how do you uh, speak with them and interact with them and give them opportunities to interact with you. Uh, that means a classical um, internet uh, presence like um, our history, our products, uh, what we did uh, before and so on. It is not modest uh, anymore at, the, for, at first and it is also not uh, very serious to just to translate it into another uh, language. Uh, would you suggest uh, that uh, the end of the uh, website uh, name, uh, uh, is it uh, in Germany uh, okay to have a punct, uh, point .eu or better point .de or point .com? I think um, there is a, a, a clear trend uh, to the uh, dot .de, so most of the um, also international dealers like Amazon and everybody um, use, uh, use uh, the .de as their main uh, web page for the German market. Um, the .de is uh, just a signal that you're uh, confirmed with all legal things also in the country and uh, it is um, more trustful um, to, to use a .de. Um, page and not uh, just an international page with a different uh, languages. Of course, there are also companies who um, have the approach to be in each country in, in, in Europe, for instance, and they use the .eu. Uh, also, I think uh, works very well uh, the .com because we are also familiar uh, to uh, use uh, presences from the American um, hemisphere. Thank you. And uh, I'm curious, uh, what about the content of uh, social media? Should it be uh, for German market on German language or can it be also in English? It should be in German because uh, people, um, I think uh, we have a, a lot of people who are familiar in English, but um, there are also a lot of people who are familiar only with German and uh, they are used to it. Um, so when you interact uh, with them and uh, uh, this is a, a very um, important fact that you should 
interact, react uh, um, on posts uh, and give the opportunity to do so. And not only to use social media like um, um, publication that. channel uh, for information, which you have also on uh, different other channels and better there. Um, but more to start more discussions and uh, interactions, um, especially between the people uh, on social media, uh, you should uh, use the German language. And um, the other question is, uh, you told about that uh, it is important to choose uh, what target group is uh, uh, addressed. Yeah? And uh, one company asks about, uh, they say, we would like to address both wholesalers and end consumers as well. Mm -hmm. What digital strategy would you recommend in this case? Um, when, when you see that uh, each person who opens a website uh, needs just uh, six to seven seconds to decide on the one on the one side what is going on on this website what it is is dealing with um, am I right here uh, is is it sympathetic uh, so you should um, give uh, clear and simple information uh, at the first view and if you want to focus on end users, then give them a lot of information or suggestions uh, at the glance. Uh, when you have a good navigation, and uh, then you give uh, also interested companies uh, for wholesaling uh, uh, also on the opportunity to find also their section where they can uh, keep in contact with you. But don't make the mistake to present yourself uh, as a company um, in the hope everybody uh, immediately understands what they can do and deal with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, maybe one short uh, question in this. Uh, um, what is your opinion about, uh, one company asks, uh, what is better for German customer, made in Lithuania or made in China? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting question because uh, made in China, I think, uh, um, does not have, still not have uh, a very high uh, recommendation um, in Germany. Um, on the other hand, a lot of uh, products uh, come from uh, China. It is uh, the biggest uh, trading partner of, of Germany by, by volume. Um, so it's a, a question of image. Um, I think China um, tried to go a new way. They, they go the way of own brands they brand their own products in the meantime they are not only delivering um, uh, products and manufacturing and give it to uh, foreign uh, companies and foreign um, brands but they build their own brands they are probably a little bit cheaper but they are uh, comparable uh, to the um, the used um, uh, habits of um, brands in, in the Western Hemisphere. So my answer is not uh, to, to, to foster the, the stores where the products are produced. It is probably an interesting and important fact to make the difference, to give a good feeling, for instance. This is uh, uh, to... to um, to mention it uh, that where and under which con uh, conditions are these products produced. So it is like um, the question of uh, sustainability Florian mentioned yes. before. So something pops up and uh, uh, people are aware of um, values and maybe the production 
um, place, uh, Lutetia, um, can be uh, fostered and can build and integrate it in the, uh, into a positive image, of course. Yeah, and um, uh, I, I uh, thank you for insp insightful uh, uh, opinion. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, in this COVID-19 uh, context, uh, we see also that uh, there are more willingness from Germany also to, to trust uh, for the made in European Union products uh, and then uh, the other, other uh, regions. Of the Absolutely. Thank you very much again, uh, Mr. Mr. Schmaus. And um, now it's time to uh, open the floor for uh, Dr. Dangwale Hakel uh, to present legal aspects of online retail in uh, Germany. Uh, her presentation uh, is about how to sell uh, from abroad to the German market without uh, setting up an entity in Germany. Uh, Dr. Hackel is a counsel in the law company Everschutz Sutherland. Um, she works in Hamburg and Munich. Uh, she is active member of North Baltic uh, Business Group uh, and advises uh, German and foreign companies on domestic and cross-border issues. Uh, her work includes matters concerning international market entries and exits, uh, corporate and commercial law, as well as corporate com compliance issues. So, uh, Dangola, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rune. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be part of this session today. And I would like to give you a few insights to share a few information with you about your e-commerce business in Germany from legal perspective. That means we will talk about legal requirements for your e-commerce business. At the beginning, just would like to tell you, sure, probably many of you already have some experience with German laws and know that many issues are quite difficult and complicated. But I can tell you if you comply with German requirements, at least in this area, so you will comply with uh, many, many requirements in the rest of the world, I would say. This is positive news. So I would like to share now my presentation. I prepared to just uh, for better following. Following my previous speakers, I mean, this is quite um, clear. I would like just to mention two points. I mean, if you would like to be successful in digital way in your e-commerce business on German market, I mean, you need to reach as many customers as possible, at least the beginning, and also create your brand, your own brand. In both cases, you can use different platforms. It was mentioned already, you can, sell your products from your own homepage, or you can use third party platform like uh, popular platforms, Amazon, or very popular in Germany for fashion, Zalando, or eBay or anything else. But in both cases, you will need to have your own website to be successful. And um, then this website has several legal requirements. I would like to highlight them here. But for the beginning, I would like to go with you into an issue with imprint and foreign company versus German entity. So in the imprint, the legal notice, notice this is legal information for the customer on your homepage, you will find legal information and it will be visible there. Are you selling from your company in your jurisdictions? That means you're selling from Lithuania or you're selling through German entity. This is visible and the people look into that. So always you have these two options and sure, this is commercial decision. How do you proceed? Uh, but um, I mean, the option with foreign entity, there is no special requirements, there is no prohibition or restrictions that you cannot uh, use your own online shop from your country, you already have. Uh, 
So you can do that, definitely. The advantage would be you could save cost for setting up a human company and uh, simply your basic issue would be to organize logistic, but do not think that maybe many would make the mistake that they do not need to comply with some requirements for customer protection in Germany, or the IT issue would be relevant also here. And the third point, also for Germany, you would need to comply with German laws regarding your homepage. This is all relevant. And um, sure, this is a good option for the beginning, you can try to do that. But another second option, it needs to be stated that Germans, as Florian already mentioned it, are a bit conservative. And this is surprising to see from many surveys that they really look into the imprint and uh, they buy more if they see German entity there. This is more confidence, more trust, and, uh, and they buy more if uh, they see in the imprint German entity. In best case, you have a German GmbH. This is a clear entity. You have an entity in Germany. You can incorporate it here. And uh, this is better visibility on the market and you have more trust from customer. But as already said, both options are possible, legally possible. And sure, it doesn't matter what option you will use. You will still need to, to comply with product safety requirements in Germany. For example, if especially it's important if you sell such goods like food or medicine, this is, uh, there are very special local requirements and uh, you have to comply with them. So going forward, I mean, I would like to summarize, maybe high, give you some, some insights on key regulatory requirements. We have many of them, but I would like to focus today just on, on the very basic requirements. And uh, we would speak about data protection, about general civil law requirements, there are a few of them, and also customer protection. It always needs to be um, separated between B2B and B2C area, as you might know. And uh, there are many others. Uh, there are some, some um, issues regarding tax um, and uh, competition laws and um, specific product requirements. Um, maybe we would start with data protection or data privacy. Sure, in Germany we have also uh, GDPR, as in every European Union country, and also some local laws, how they work. And um, the website needs to be complied with these requirements. So, very short about them. Um, first of all, I would, say, I would mention privacy by design. If you set up a website for Germany, what is important first? You need to have a concept, as Joseph also already mentioned, and you need have a concept first a strategy and if you create your your website you need to know what would you like to do what what marketing tools and programs would you like to use for data collection there are many of them and would you like to use cookies or not advertising or not but in any case whatever you would like to use please do not include and implement marketing tools or technical functions you cannot turn off later that would be my recommendation because data protection authorities in Germany, they have a very clear view how some tools should be implemented and you can follow them. This is fine. But we all know that marketing tools develop very fast and, uh, and maybe some of them will be new. Something will be not known for German data protection authorities and new standards will develop. So in the future, if a data protection authority has something against one of or other function, you can simply switch off and don't need to, to restart uh, all the all the system and you don't need to change all the system. This is this point. Another point is privacy policy. This is um, a document you have to publish on your website. This is about uh, how it works with the data protection, with data collection and processing of the data. This is kind of information for customer. And it's also a very good instrument to show that you are very professional and deal with data on the right way. 
this is this is important to have it. Then another point is also permission to collect and process personal data. So you might all know that you would need the consent of um, of the customer, and uh, basically there are some tools, and uh, and uh, the customer should be asked if does give or she gives uh, give a uh, consent or not this is the basic rule but there are other exceptions when you can use and collect personal data like um, execution of contracts for example this is quite this is legal way how to collect data and how to use that and also for especially i would like to highlight advertising and cookies this is quite uh, common uh, tools uh, they they are used on websites but for any kind of advertising, for example, sending an email, you would need a consent of the relevant person. And uh, amazing is here that it's applicable not only for B2C area, just to protect the customer, but also for B2B area. So this is also a relevant point. The same is with cookies. If you're on the homepage, then, then you need to implement the function uh, that uh, the user accept the use of, of cookies. So um, further requirements going forward from data privacy perspective, um, important to say if you use um, pixels or plugins or other things from third parties like Facebook or Instagram, this is important that you have a contract with them. This is a requirement according to GDPR. And um, this good news is that there is no need to be too scary or to think I will not get the contract with such a big company. It's not an issue because uh, this all big players know these requirements and uh, and there are standard contracts and it's not a big deal to, to get a contract with them. But this is a requirement to, to have a contract that data protection will be in uh, will be uh, safe here. And uh, another point, keeping data in the system. Uh, there are also um, many issues with that, and there's a big discussion, also public discussions in Germany, the right to be forgotten. That means when the provider of website should, should delete and the data, they use and there are a lot of uh, a lot of opinions and uh, you will not find a clear period saying after this and this period, you have to delete the data. There are a lot of exceptions there. It might be immediately six months, one year. And uh, for example, issues related to tax should be, should be kept 10 years. So it always depends what kind of data are collected and what would you like to do with that. So going forward to, to the next point, general civil law and customer protection. I would like to mention here general civil law requirements linked to our general terms and conditions in Germany. We have a very sophisticated, I would say, and quite complicated German Terms, general terms and condition law, there is a full chapter in our civil code, and there are so many rules there, very detailed, and it's always important to comply with these laws. So as a seller, because you sell, it doesn't matter on which platform or direct, you would, will need general terms and conditions, and um, they need to be fine with German law. And just an example, the warranty period, basically, according to German law, is 24 months. But in B2C area, if you deal with, uh, with private customers, you cannot shorten this period. No way. This is illegal. But if in the area, B2B area, you can make 12 months. And this is fine. So there are a lot of details, and, uh, and it's always recommended to... Re let review your terms and conditions by a, a German lawyer. And sometimes we, what we do just to be efficient, sometimes we tell simply the website owner should simply translate all these documents he uses in his web shop in other country. And then we would review them from German perspective. And then this is quite efficient way to to look if everything is fine, in general, to review the website from German law perspective. But 
translated website, I mean. But um, in this uh, situation, in special situation regarding general terms and conditions, I would personally say that the best way is always to ask us to give a standard document and discuss some, uh, some specialities and maybe include some special things they are very important for the client and then that would be more efficient way because um, because many require many amendments might be needed uh, considering uh, different uh, different law systems and please know that on the on the website you are always very visible and everybody can see this documents can see the website and everybody can see if something is wrong and not legal and you can simply get a warning letter uh, from the competitor <laughs> but this is a competition law and um, i would like i would not like to go into details in considering the time left so one special point i would like also to mention is um, customer protection and special information requirements we have. You should always inform about the seller, who is the seller, and I already mentioned it, the imprint, the impression we call in Germany. It should be reachable in clicks. This is a German requirement. And uh, you have to also inform the customer yeah, about cancellation rights and the uh, right to send back uh, the goods in 14 days and uh, some, some uh, sellers give even more time. And um, one interesting thing is, um, is the bottom. I mean, you need to label and highlight the bottom. Buy now, jetzt kaufen. It means the customer should see the moment when he's going to conclude the, the contract. And this is clear if, if it is written on the bottom, by now. For example, if it's written submit order, this is not the conclusion of the contract and, and that might be some issues for discussions. Is this fine or not? Because for customer who is not lawyer, it's not clear what's happening to submission, submitting um, an order. Do I conclude the contract or not? The best way is to be very clear. And uh, the next point I would like also to mention is advertising. I already mentioned it um, in, in uh, talking about data protection that advertising, if you send emails, newsletters, you always need consent of the recipient. And it doesn't matter do you deal in B2C or B2B area. And in general, it needs to be mentioned that German law is very strict. And uh, there are many rules, they, this is just example, but there are many rules, they are meant for B2C area, but they are applicable also for B2B, because um, German protect, customer protection law is very strict and, uh, and they extend it to some extent also to business areas. So in, in short, from my side. And this, this is key requirements we have, but sure we have more requirements. And just to mention shortly some tax issues, for example, European Union now preparing a new regulate, regulator requirement, the so-called VAT e-commerce package, which is very interesting for this area. If you Really shortly speaking, that would be if you sell products from Lithuania to Germany, you might be obliged to buy VAT, uh, to pay VAT, sorry, uh, pay VAT, but uh, there would be no need for registration for tax purposes. And, but all these laws will come into force next year, and um, and there will be some unification of the rules for European Union and uh, this is quite a good thing um, and um, we need to see how how it will be developed how it will develop and um, another point like like um, competition law issues are also very important if your homepage is not um, right from legal perspective simply speaking so you can get warning letters from competitors and it uh, could cost a lot of money this uh, this issues so from my perspective please keep in mind that 
you're always very visible on the on your website and uh, it's not a big deal to have the right uh, website from legal perspective so there is not uh, much i mean there, there, there's not much cost to do that and efforts and you have your piece frankly speaking this is uh, very important and my final word would be uh, you are visible and simply take care that you have all your legal documents signed so but both options goes as uh, mentioned it at the beginning you can sell direct from german from from ulysanian company and also you can sell from the company established here in germany uh, both options works and um, thanks for your attention and uh, i'm happy to answer questions if any yeah thank you very much dangola it was uh, uh, very interesting points and very useful ones uh, for the lithuanian uh, companies uh, who would like to open uh, own uh, websites uh, in for german market and um, we have some questions uh, as well and uh, uh, one is about um, how long it takes to set up a German entity for our branch and uh, what is the share capital in Germany? Uh, for, and maybe to add another question in this, uh, what you recommend? It is better to start with individual business or GmbH? And uh, you have uh, also a lot of uh, um, experience with uh, uh, companies and, and German clients. And uh, maybe could you comment, uh, uh, have stuff in Germany uh, is better or uh, it is okay also to have uh, uh, stuff uh, uh, in Lithuania, but of course, German speaking. Thank you, Master Rune. Thank you for this question. Sure, uh, with pleasure, I would answer that. And uh, how long does it take uh, to set up a company? Basically, you will go into German market. You will, if you decide to set up a German company, you will set up a GmbH, this German Limited Liability Company, or another option would be uh, would be a branch from your Lithuanian company and the branch in Germany. And there are two options for that. Basically for both options, I would say regarding timeline about one month, realistically. I mean, preparation of documents goes very fast and uh, considering traveling restrictions today, you don't even need to come to Germany. We can work with powers of attorney or or instructions. I mean, and um, this is possible to set up company here without physical attendance. But please note that setting up the company, there is notarial certification needed. So we need a notary appoint appointment. And um, after that, there are some, uh, some also requirements to register this company in the commercial register and it might take time. Basically, preparation of documents and um, notary appointment, it goes very fast. It's not, not a big deal. And just uh, some formal requirements like um, right POA with uh, all the apostiles and uh, this can take some, some time. And uh, then we depend on the workload of commercial register. Even if we are very fast, the registration happens according to workload of commercial register. So basically it takes two, two to three weeks and it's not recommended to start business before because you are personally liable. There is no restriction of liability before registration. So I would say basically one month and then um, sometimes uh, it could take even longer. We had cases if um, if a bank account is not uh, not cannot be opened for whatever reasons, it can it might take time because the banks they have quite comprehensive comprehensive uh, review regarding some compliance issues, and it might take time. And sometimes they they ask for physical attendance of the managing director here in Germany, but we have some solutions also. I mean, 
why I'm talking about bank account, because you need to pay sheer capital in order to be registered. And the sheer capital, capital just to answer the second question, is uh, 25,000 euros. If you go by, if you set up a German GmbH, and there are some, um, also could be less if you set up a small company, but uh, I would not recommend it because it's not taken very serious on the market. And, um, and then uh, with this bank account, we have some solutions. Sometimes uh, the managing director can go to the bank branch in his country, for example, or can simply confirm that many of them worked also, just to make it better for, for a client. And, um, and we don't want him to travel, especially today, because of this all restrictions. And um, there are a lot of ways how to accelerate that. But compliance review from the bank side will be necessary. This is legal requirement. And I would like to even really encourage the, the customers and the clients and everybody who goes to German market simply simply do what uh, simply provide documents for what bank is asking and provide documents what commercial register is asking because a lot of discussions will bring not much and you will simply extend the period for the registration so cooperation would be paramount there but uh, just to summarize we need to uh, around one month, would be less or a bit longer. And you need 25,000 in the, as a share capital if, if you set up a German game, GmbH. And your second part of the questions, I noticed branch uh, or, or separate company. Uh, my personal recommendation would be a separate company for a very simple reason. I mean, uh, the formal requirements for setting up the branch, even if we are in the European Union, they are really very strict and, uh, and it might take endlessly until we are fine with all formal requirements. And we are talking about shareholder resolutions about the same managing director who is in, in, in this company, in, in the company, the main company and then in the branch there are a lot of requirements and and you lose a lot of time and this time is also cost in how to set up this branch here and the big disadvantage on the market is of the of this branches that branch is not ta taken very serious comparing to the normal gmbh and um, so I would not really recommend to go with the branch. But um, sure, 25,000 is, um, is a huge amount of money. And you have also some administration cost of this company in Germany. And, but still, you can try with the small company. It calls UG in Germany, UG GmbH, that 500 might be enough. But still, if um, the market knows that share capital is so long, is so, so low, uh, they, the perception and the image is not that good. So it, there, it has liquidity reasons and credibility reasons. But um, the best way, if you want to be successful, the best way would be German GmbH. You have a separate entity. You have clear legal regime for that. And this is a wonderful. Um, image and perception for, for the German market. Thank you, Thank you Dangole. Um, uh, I am sure that the Lithuanian companies, if they have more questions, that they will come again. Uh, and um, maybe uh, another aspect uh, was uh, it is important uh, for websites. It is uh, one question. Um, if the website is located outside of Germany, but sells in Germany, can terms and conditions be in English or it must be in German? And uh, one uh, other question is about when launching a product on German market, does the product name need to be essentially in German or not? Maybe you could comment uh, in short uh, that aspects. What about languages uh, requirements? Could you repeat a second question? 
Yes, it is a case like when launching a product on German market, does the product name need to be essentially in German and the description can be in English? Language aspects, <laughs> thank you. I mean, generally, you can use also um, regarding terms and conditions, you can use also your, your English stuff, but for German market, as also Joseph already mentioned it, and, and Lori mentioned it, uh, Germans are conservative, and, uh, and all the, you are better if you go in German language definitely uh, regarding this also legal documents because if it goes to basically it would be not invalid but if you imagine if you go to court and uh, and then the judge they would really like to read german version and not the english one definitely and uh, and also perception of the, from the customer side uh, you would always go better with the German version. And um, and also regarding customer protect, uh, protection, you can have, we will always have an argument that nobody can misunderstand something because it's in German. So, so this is uh, this point and regarding launching a product and going to this market, it does not need to be German. You can use Lithuanian names, but uh, I would uh, like to, point out here that you would really need to review and to speak also with a native speaker about the name because if it's the name which does not mean anything in German or it sounds it sounds not German I would say it's not a big deal this is fine it might be it might be even very useful for branding I hope uh, Joseph will agree with me because uh, you can you can use uh, this word it's not known in German but um, sure, you need to speak about this because uh, with, with somebody, with an expert, because you never know what does it mean in German, this, or what association could be with this name. And, um, but from legal perspective, you can use your Lithuanian names, English names, and uh, there is no special requirement to use it in German. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dangole. Maybe, Josef, uh, you could comment also on this question, uh, which name is more um, useful uh, for German market in which languages? Uh, how it is. Yeah, there are uh, some requirements you uh, should uh, focus on. Um, so there is a um, authority in Munich European brand uh, uh, institution there you can register names and um, before you use a name it's good to check um, whether this uh, name uh, which is uh, probably an acronym or a uh, completely artificial built uh, um, brand name for a product or even for the company um, if it is uh, already used and registered, uh, like the trademark, uh, the R in it, or trademark in, in the US, um, and this uh, gives you more um, stability um, that you really can use it and uh, nobody can uh, fight against it. Okay. And, uh, uh, so, so probably it is not the complete answer. Sorry, because uh, um, it is not necessary to, to, um, to have a German name, which means when you have a table and you uh, name this um, um, with a fantasy name, of course, uh, but the description of the table um, should be very precise in a German language. Thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, uh, good to know, and uh, uh, we are going uh, to, to to the end. And I would like to ask for the closing remarks uh, with uh, uh, a bit uh, provoking question uh, about about also Lithuanian and German markets. Uh, what can uh, can be uh, done, and uh, maybe you could uh, tell a few. Um, sentences about uh, for, as closing remarks. Uh, what prospects do you see for the cross-border commerce uh, from Lithuania to Germany? Um, maybe 
for this, uh, how we can uh, uh, advantage our geographically uh, nearness uh, and, and uh, to, to, to come more to Germany. I would like to ask, uh, uh, yeah, Florian, um, for, for your opinion and uh, others, uh, what you think. Well, um, I can start if you want. Um, in general, I would say um, I, I come from this European economics um, economics perspective, and I would say that um, especially from this perspective, we can see that um, there are even more um, regulations on the European um, uh, um, stage. So we see um, uh, harmonization of standards in different aspects and in different areas. And this is, um, in my opinion, a huge booster for um, cross-border trade, cross-border um, retail, because um, we see that this gives a lot of security for external um, companies. And um, I think this is the first baseline, the, the environment, the regulatory, regulatory environment, which um, will help that um, cross-border um, retail and cross-border um, um, trade will increase in the, in the um, next year. So this is already a good, um, and in general, a very good perspective for every economic company. Um, now, um, put it more on retail and on e-commerce. Um, as I said, digitization brings people together. And um, uh, I also mentioned services in my um, presentation. Um, and services are a huge, um, uh, have a huge share in, in e-commerce as well. Um, so um, I think that this is much better and much easier to, to focus on now and, and which has a, has a good development. Um, so this very specific part of e-commerce will, will have a boost in the, car in the next years um, on, on cross-border um, e-commerce. But also, um, I think we, we see a, a change in, in the mindset that people see how necessary um, it is to have this um, this European market, especially in, in, in e-commerce. Um, we see that people um, yeah, are aware of this, this market power, for example, of Amazon and so on. And we see that they sometimes turn a little bit more to these local, regional, but also European um, alternatives. So um, especially, as I said, e-commerce, because it's so obvious there, um, this market power. So um, I think that customers are ready to um, um, for, for new products that they are open-minded also for, for products from, from countries that are um, um, in, in Europe and maybe also not this typical Western European countries. I think Germans are very used to, to French products, for example, or Italy, Italian products. I think um, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't expect that Germans are also that hypercritical for, for Lithuanian um, uh, products. I think that there is not a big problem with that because there was one question on, on um, products made in China or products made in Lithuania. In my opinion, it, um, I, I would always say that um, made in Lithuania is not, not, a, not a bad thing for, for the product um, and doesn't have a, a, a problematic label. So I would say um, there is, um, we can have a good projection on, especially in, gen in general, on, on, um, European on the European economy and cross-border um, trade, especially also in um, e-commerce, especially in, in um, services, but also in, um, uh, as I said, grocery product especially because of um, the digitalization. This would be my very optimistic, I know very optimistic um, uh, way of seeing uh, the, the, um, the future of um, cross-border um, retail. Thank you very much. Uh, for, uh, thoughts and uh, this optimism, we need also that. And uh, a word goes to uh, Josef. Yeah, um, I think uh, I will abound on uh, Florian. I'm also optimistic, but in a in a, um, a little bit different uh, uh, side. Um, I think uh, the pandemic we are in, and unfortunately, nobody knows how it will develop in the next month. But on a on a long term, on a long side, it will uh, foster um, the European um, spirit or the European uh, way of. Um, dealing and uh, the, the values we share in, in Europe are uh, existing. And I think uh, there are a lot of benefits uh, we uh, will uh, face in the next time when we um, foster and deepen uh, the um, uh, corporations. And I think uh, one of the 
uh, milestones uh, we have in the e-commerce is our the da data protection um, um, strategy of um, um, the European Union and even uh, the emerging uh, Silicon Valley uh, takes over a lot of parts of it because it is friendly to the customers. It makes clear um, conditions for the um, whole trade and everything. And I think um, uh, the, the Lithuanian point of view is you are uh, part of the um, European Union and Germany is uh, in the center, uh, it, it is a big uh, business place, marketplace, uh, which should uh, have the function of um, developing the whole European uh, zone uh, in, in uh, both uh, directions. And I think uh, digitalization is the only and the main way um, to build um, a common sense in uh, a new direction, in a future direction, which, which is not just uh, more of the old things. It is a lot of uh, threats and a lot of uh, uh, changing uh, the game. And I hope it will change into a, um, a very prosperative um, perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Josef. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, during that uh, COVID-19 uh, period, uh, we see that there are more and more uh, interests from Germany to Lithuania and to near uh, uh, boarding, near shoring uh, um, companies and, and countries. And uh, uh, thanks again. Uh, and uh, uh, please, uh, Dangole, uh, tell us what, what is your opinion. You as as born Lithuanian. Nangola. I have all the perceptions, but after twenty years, I'm also. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Great. So, so I would like to also share the positive attitude of my previous speakers. I mean. Um, I'm also very positive and optimistic on developments because Lithuania is very modern and creative. What I, it's my perception. And also from my experience advising Lithuanian companies, what I see, this question was discussed today, made in China or made in Lithuania. I can answer very clear, made in Lithuania might be a very good advantage. First of all, because it's European Union. And secondly, they can present themselves very well. And the customer, German customer, is curious, seeing made in Germany or in Baltics, what is that? I would like to try. And um, in general, Baltic image is, uh, sure, thanks also great uh, work of Lithuanian representations here and Baltic representations here. And uh, it's, it's quite well developed here and it's getting better and better. And Baltics are perceived as really modern and creative countries. So I would say my optimism is, um, is, is a reality. And um, from a lawyer perspective, I would like uh, to give uh, simply three takeaways for, for, for to the end. I mean, it's better to do the preparation very careful going to German market and especially, especially looking from legal perspective to get the things right at the beginning then to fight and struggle with them if something goes wrong so this is clear for for any Lithuanian company going to German market the second thing is I would ask everybody to dedicate a time to go to German market uh, because uh, sometimes it's done and like um, partly like uh, we will try, we will see what happens. German market is a very sophisticated market and if you go you have to apply several rules but you can say your creativity and modern attitude and modern goods 
what uh, are really demanded in Germany. Uh, the demand is, is there. And the uh, third point is, uh, as you are really creative and modern, protect your IP. As, um, as Joseph already mentioned it, um, some patent registrations might be useful, but there are also many ways how to do that uh, or not disclose information about your business because you don't want to be copied and you don't want to bring ideas and not participate on the profit of them. So protect your IP. And um, in general, I would wish you simply good luck on that. Thank you very much, Dangole. And uh, yes, uh, we are going to the end and uh, I would like really to thank you all uh, uh, our speakers, uh, Dangole, Josef and Florian for your insightful presentations and answers. And um, thank you all uh, for participating in today's, uh, today's uh, webinar online. And we hope um, Lithuanian enterprises have heard uh, uh, insightful information and useful advices for your business. And if you have any questions, uh, do not hesitate to contact us later. And of course, uh, follow the uh, Enterprise Lithuania and Lithuanian Embassy in, in Germany and German and Baltic uh, Chamber of Commerce in Lithuania on social media and our web pages, uh, on our um, profiles for the future webinars. And uh, thank you once again to all of you and uh, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.